East Coast Hockey League. I started out playing. I played out here for about seven years in the East Coast. It was awesome. Enjoyed it. I was a player coach for three of those years near the end. One of those was with Greenville. Um, I played mostly in Fort Wayne for the Comets. Uh, and again, throughout the whole process, I was always learning. I have my own online business, BAPS Hockey. It's uh, predominantly on Hockey IQ. But again, we hone in on a lot of the skill sets, the details, the things that allow you to make those plays. And even though you can see it, you need to be able to execute um, at a very fine, detailed uh, level. So we try to work on those things as much as possible. And that's what I did as like a side gig. It started like in college, but then it turned into something a lot bigger, especially in the summers, uh, having the summers off during pro. And that piggybacked into working with Team China and KRS uh, two years ago. Uh, was it fortunate enough to go to the Olympics with Team China as a skills coach? And they, we were working in tandem with four other coaches. It was a great experience. Uh, Brian Adolski was my mentor, head coach, and he really helped me. He allowed me to, again, share a lot of these insights from a skill standpoint and hockey IQ and really hone in some of my skills on the women's side, which uh, eventually piggybacked into finishing off with the men's side. Um, they got, got to work on the video end with them and get on the ice with them in the world championships. And that turned into this job coming to Greenville. Um, again, I always wanted to work with pro players and eventually after like a lot of like there was a huge shift lost about 10 coaches last year and uh so i was able to get the assistant job here and going into my second season with greenville we we had a great year we're affiliated with la so i got to learn a lot of their structure and systems um they use the 131 i'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it it's it's different it's obviously more common in europe um, but in the NHL, it's, I don't think you see it as much. You see a lot more 2-1-2, 1-2-2. Two, one, two, two, so it was a huge learning experience and uh, really saw a lot of the benefits of that. And that could always be a topic to go into. Like, but it, I've seen how effective it can be, especially against really dynamic, uh, uh, fast skating teams. And yeah, and this year I was able to, again, get the most out of a lot. We had a very young team. Um, very good power play going into the playoffs. Unfortunately, in the first round, I felt like we were the underperforming Toronto Maple Leafs where we just couldn't get enough out of our, we couldn't get enough out of our guys, our top end guys. Um, our depth uh, was definitely really, really good. A lot of guys stepped up, but it was a great learning experience overall for a lot of those young players. And really, again, like you see in the playoffs right now, you're seeing how important um, experience veteran leadership is. Uh, being there before because having not having that there you're unable to manage the momentum the flow um, especially like you see a team like Carolina has kind of been there um, you see a team again like Dallas who's kind of been there but they just don't have they just didn't have the mindset to like really stall all that momentum from the opposing team and like to lose 4-0 to lose 5-1 like Toronto did um, just shows that inexperience and we kind of ex we experienced that and so it was really good for us the coaching staff to understand that and really now working to build a team that can perform and win when we need them to in the playoffs so um, that's where we're at right now that's kind of my background and uh, today just really wanted to talk about um some hockey IQ and the transition was one of the big things we talked about this year and just want to look at through the application and the skill set and how you can use that uh, to train teams or our individuals. And I found a lot of benefit with some of these concepts. So yeah, that's all I, that's, I feel like that's, uh, that was a long winded intro, but uh um, but that's kind of like where I'm at right now, where I, got, where I came from. And yeah, just excited to share some of these videos and get you guys going on. Hopefully incite some, some people say like, okay, I like that, or this is a better way to look at it. Just more so trying to use it to learn and see um, what other people are thinking of. So yeah, I think Wally's on the phone. I know he said that. 
And uh, does anyone have any questions? Well, do you use a lot of transition games? Well, yeah, like transitions is huge for us because of we were in the one three one. They yeah. think so. The way they would teach it was initially like is a defending system to stop really fast skating teams, but. Like when, when our LA guys came down, they tell us like, no, like this is a transition based system. It's built to like stall out the speed, but also allow us to get on the attack. Cause essentially instead of the one, one, three, where you have the stack on the blue line, we have the stack on the red line. And so now you have four guys that can attack right off the rush. And so trying to get that taught to our guys, so their guys got a little too passive. And so once we were able to teach them, like, hey, you can attack off of this, like, you, you can create a ton more offense. And so we saw, like, okay, we can use transitions more often here and try to, um, again, really try to get that going with our group. So what I'm asking, though, is do you, do you, Mason, you uh, Tom, let me make, give an explanation to Mason. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you're, you're talking about the neutral zone transition. You're trying to create a turnover. Over the many years, we've talked about transition in all zones. Yeah. In other words, you transition off the forecheck. You have, you have transition off the breakout. You have transition in the neutral zone. And depending on what you choose to do and where you choose to focus, to me, as sort of the art of coaching is, are you a team that's a transition team for the length of the ice from the neutral zone? Uh, so our focus on transition is that moment of a turnover, where whatever zone it is, and whether it's the one three one system you use to try to create it, or a one four, uh, do it at the blue line uh, by pinching and trying to create a turnover. I, you know, that's where we're from. Tom has more transition games on his website mm. that he uses over many years, and it worked with the best. European coaches on this concept. So you, you go ahead and uh, Tom, uh, you're, you, you just to extend your thought process for Mason's sake. And I, I'm sure interested, Mason, in the videos of what you got. But I think you appreciate where we all come from on this transition topic. If, if the NHL, I'm curious about your take on the playoffs and where they're capitalizing on transition and uh but go ahead tom just to continue well well what i do i go i go watch practices and i've been doing it for 20 years and i take little videos and break them down and all this but i i went i've gone to finland many times and erica westerland came to calgary once for hockey canada and did a lot of stuff about transition games so there's no whistles the players come in and out you can create whatever situation you want but what happens is you when the puck goes in the corner it doesn't end you got to get the puck make a breakout play and go the other way and i don't see very many pro teams do this babcock used a lot of them and uh the odd time i i, I see some but it's not a real common thing in the uh north american pro so that's what i was asking do you use yeah transition games to work on the transition i would say early on we did and then as the year went on with like our very limited practice schedule and time we started leaning toward like we would lean towards fixing the deficiencies in the 131 or fixing our breakout or fixing our or trying to re-establish our ozone principles and that's kind of the challenge i'd love to play more games the other problem is when you get with these some of these older guys keeping them motivated can be a little bit challenging i'd say at times they want uh, especially with the fatigue and how tough the schedule can be so trying to pocket them in pocket in the games is can be challenging at times but I completely agree with you. Like, I've, like when I played, I loved it. I'm like, let's let's play more games. And so, from a transition standpoint, game wise, we'd usually use the 
the four on two one where they're transitioning back and forth where the nets on two like you just move the net you have two nets inside one zone i'm sure you've seen you all have done it already but it's like a little power play game but you cut the end zone in half and then they just play back and forth and they're just trying to work work off each other i saw a team doing that last night when i was going to play hockey yeah and, and it's a good one. one my site yesterday too yeah no it, it and it's a good one yeah. So, so that, I'm talking about I'm, t- I'm talking about you create the situation, and the players just they flow into the. So you can do your two on ones, three on twos, whatever you want to do, and and uh, using these games instead of whistles and, and really structured, and really structured things. I, I think I, I think. Uh, practices tend to be way too structured and they're not very game-like you know like you tell everybody what they got to do and they do it and the situation they know the situation there's no changing in the situation kind of thing so well, what's yeah. your website i love to take i love to check it out that no i yes things are way too structured for sure they they really are and it's uh i thought like when i was going to get into coaching and be like okay yeah let's do it let's all let's overhaul it it's it's tough and i've real until like a, a head coach i think it's a tricky position um especially when you have like there's ways that have worked and so i really do think though like that's that's where the game should transition to is where it's no whistles because like in a the game there's not like all this like like I, I actually worked with a coach last year on the men's side and he talked about like eliminating the like doing drills where there's no whistle and the players were just reading off of each other to allow them just to like play in sync and flow and just transition normally like they would in a game. Uh, Mason, uh, that's exactly where we all come from relative to the way the game is going. I'm curious about you, where you're at, what you're doing at the level you're working at and you said you had some clips. Yeah. I think that's your comfort zone of what you're working with. And we may ask questions pertaining to our frames of reference. Mm-hmm. And you're the youngest guy here. And that means the guy that's learning because you're doing it on the fly. And you're going to be changing many coaching jobs, which you have. Oh, yeah. And we've sort of been in and out of more coaching jobs than you've thought about yet. So if if you can share your screen, Mason, we've just had Sammy Joe Small join. Um, and I'm I'm I would really like to you sent me three clips. I haven't had a chance to look at them yet. I've been in and out of emergency dealing with some medical issues. Uh, but I would sure like to see how you you know using your links and talking about what you're doing, uh, how you do it, uh, how you apply it with the group you're working with. So I can see your screen now, Mason. And oh, you can, you're good. I was just, yeah, it's, it's. Everybody can see a screen. I just see black. Yeah, yeah. It's, gonna, it's gonna unlock it now, one second. Too many privacy settings. And I'd ask everybody to raise their hand if they've got a question or something to add and delve into relative to what Jason's noticing. So I've lost your screen share. Sorry about that. We're good. Should be good to go now. So can you see the screen now, my screen? No, I can't. No, no, that's interesting. Yeah, I just clicked share screening and said it was good to go. We saw it for a second there. How about now? Well, I'm just going to jump in and tell you that Rick Puttick was on the other Sharks call. And so yeah. I just have sent him the link. He was waiting there on the other one. So I sent him the link to this one. Just okay. so you guys- Thanks for joining, Sammy. Okay. 
Still nothing? Still nothing, uh, Mason. Weird. It says we should be good right now. Hmm. Share. Desktop. Odd. That is really weird. Okay, I'll try one other thing here. Sammy, when you use this uh, program, have you shared screens with people that were watching and they've shared their screen with you? And yeah, you... let me just see if, if I share my screen right now, what uh, that does. OK. So odd. Yeah, that's. Uh, Do you see some a... random documents? No, we're it's so dark for me. Page. Yeah. Yeah, see, I don't see anything right now. Yeah. Uh, technology. Do you yeah. guys see that? No. Uh, no, we just got help Terse joining. There's nothing on the share screen, so. Uh, yeah. Hey, Wally. Wally, can you can you send Rick a uh, a note? He's on the other. Yeah, I think yep. Sam just did. Hal. Sammy's looking I at. I did. Yeah, I just sent him the link. Okay. Well, we've got Mason on, and now we've <laughs> lost. I don't see Mason anymore. <laughs> oh God, what's going on? Go. Here? No, he's still there, Wally. But yeah, still here. Don't know why it's not working. Oh, there he's back. Uh, he's yeah, I was trying to get the screen sharing thing to work. Oh, there. We. Got, I've got you now. Or got somebody who's yeah that I can yeah, see all of our images on screen share. So you can see me right now. I can see you, but everybody else as well. Okay. You might just yeah, need so to cool. yeah minimize. There you go. Oh, Perfect. Oh, Attack go. on turbo. Attacking on off a turnover. Okay, so I don't know what happened, but it's working. We'll see how long for. But uh, but yeah, so the way I structure it out, so I got the three videos. So the first one is just going to be off of a turnover. And then the second one is skill application towards it. And then essentially like I'll work through the transition game in a game setting. And so that's kind of how I broke it down. Um, I'm going to it's going to be tough for me to see if anyone's waving their hand if or just just shout out and say hey i have a question or something just and i'll stop at any point in time so i'm gonna have this here i just want to let everybody know that rick made it over yep. hi rick hey rick glad you made it so the first one so again tacking off a turnover the first thing to focus on is recognizing when that turnover happens and that's going to be specifically towards the player without the puck and so here that initial turnover happens and so right here boom it happens sorry it's a little bit slower so now recognizing recognizing that turnover is going to happen so now we need to work to open space so this the faster we can do that you can now start working off the back, off the back. And that's something we talked a lot about this year was once you get the defending team puck focused, we got to work into those little pockets behind them. And it just be, it just happens so quickly. Like you have about three seconds to find that space. And now we're able to generate through that pocket, even with five guys in coverage. Same thing here. So we do a good job off the four check force that turnover right here good recognition coming into there you're going to see initially he puts his stick in a defending position just in case the reverse happens the second he recognizes that turnover happens now we're in that shooting position we get body position finding where that open man is and it's just again you got about three seconds as like when we were observing some of the some of the different transitions in the NHL, we kind of marked it as, and this is like me, I coach other people that we've been working through some of this concept, is about one to four seconds before that defending team comes back into coverage. And so if you can get into that pocket, obviously four seconds is 
very lengthy. It depends how extended the play is, but that we try to tell our players, like, you have that one to two seconds to make that play. And, like, right here is a perfect example of you see this pressure happens, and now that turnover happens, and it's right here. He sees that, and now he gets puck focused. Me and Wally talked about it where you just kind of get a little brain fart. You're like, oh, I lose him for that split second, and now he's working open space, slips up, and now that thing's in the back of the net. And now here, so that's like where the player without the puck trying to recognize when that turnover happens. The player with the puck needs to get in that attacking mode right away. If there's time and space, once you turn them over, we want to try to get in between the dots as consistently as possible. And here, Hagel does a great job. The turnover happens on the blue line. And now it's get to the middle, get to the middle, get to the net. And now you're going to see that full-blown converging. And now you have that number situation and boom, just getting bodies to the net. Here, same thing. And this will get into the next video where I talk about the first touch. Turnover happens, and it's all about, okay, is our first touch leading us to the middle of the ice? Are we accelerating off the touch? Are we underhandling the puck? Like the underhandling being a huge thing we talk about all year. Everyone wants to stick handle like Patrick Kane, but the reality is the simple is better. That first touch allows them to get him inside to the dots, and now we're able to attack. It's a simple play, but very, very, very effective. Here, same thing, same concept off the rim. Rim air happens, and now first touch is taking us to the middle of the ice. And now we're taking pucks to the net. He has to pay a price, but if you want to score goals, that's what you need to do. And it forces them, and you'll see they take a penalty off of that play. Last one off of the rim right here. So this rim happens, boom, and now that accelerating off that touch. Can we accelerate off that first touch? Can we get inside the dots? And now that mindset of like, I need to take this puck to the net off of a turnover. And lastly here, again, Nylander does a great job forcing the turnover. Instead of observing going up the wall, he's working to take that puck inside the dots, accelerate off that first touch, and now catch them off guard before they're able to get back into coverage. Does that Mason, make sense? Mason, I've, I've got a, <clears throat> like you're, you're talking like a coach showing video to yeah. uh, two players. And um, I'm, the question I'm asking you is when you use this video, who do you use it with? What for? What do you want us to get out of it? So I want us, so the main objective through all three videos is really trying to see where this concept can be applied to try to give a skill concept to really work into either a practice setting it with your own teams with your own individuals and structurally the last video is seeing where i believe the nhl is moving towards and again i know we were talking earlier about the neutral zone but trying to use that first touch use those quick ups and how we can really amplify our transition game to create more offense and okay. I, I, I'm going to interrupt you here because I don't know. My, my thinking is, you know, when you turn it over, there's that moment of reaction and quick reaction and decision making that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. it, it's all about quick thinking. And Tom Malloy's point on playing small area games. You have to apply your skills in the context of a situation. Mm -hmm. and most coaches, and we do, we talk to minor coaches often. So this video for minor coaches, they would be lost. Okay. My okay. point is, and even for pro players, I'm wondering, do they see that already? Do they see more than we see, faster than we see it? Are we in keeping with the speed of their brains and that's what i feel that the game has come to is that the players are probably ahead of us as a group in terms of quick thinking so what we're advocating here is let's start our kids when they play hockey to 
once they've got a simple structure, they are free to play within it and think more quickly within it. So that's sort of where I'm coming from. And I don't know if anybody in the group has anything to add. Tom, can you comment? Yeah, well, I, I really like this. It shows the, you know, it shows that, like, Kachuk won with this play last night, right? Yeah. He got that play and he drove the net right away, right? Especially on the power play, like, that was, it, it, it's, a, it's a shame that, and it, it, it's a shame that the strong side D with how aggressive the PP, PK was, um, as with how late it was, but that's what makes them so effective. Um, I talked to I talked to my co a buddy of mine in Chicago, and he said like when they did their analytics with the NHL, that the reason you're seeing more of the dime in PK and that passive PK is because traditionally in the playoffs, anyone with a very aggressive P PK tends to struggle, and that's where you saw Tampa Bay struggle a lot last year, especially against uh, the Ranger PP. Okay, Mason, go ahead. If anybody has any questions, observations, takeaways, things to add, thanks, Tom. Tim Bothwell, go ahead, Tim. Well, I just, I was just gonna, thanks, well, I just gonna comment that it's, uh, you know, it's interesting, like Mason makes that observation about, you know, maybe there's a tendency now for NHL teams to be a bit more passive on the PK, it's like the it's like a pendulum that swings back and forth. Uh, you know, really for the last ten or twelve years, hyper aggressive penalty killing um, has been the mode, and it might be as simple as some uh, some teams are getting more effective and have seen so much of the really hyper aggressive penalty killing that they're finding ways. To break it down um, and really one of the biggest things you could probably do as a coach and Wally's talked about this a lot in the past is try to coach your teams to uh, be able to switch from a sort of hyper aggressive mode to a more passive mode that's where the best penalty killing groups are you know they know when to pressure and how to pressure in a very aggressive manner and they also know when they need to either box up or diamond up to maybe frustrate the power play a little bit. It's a it's a cat and mouse game. Yeah. Mason, I'm going to get you to go on, but uh, I have a question for you. And Tom, you brought up the point, the winning goal last night. And I'm not just saying the winning goal last night with Kachuk, but each and every one of the their ability to score – in critical situations, they take a full advantage of the time and space faster than anybody, that particular unit. So it, it gets down to they're connected. And, and you mentioned, uh, Mason, at the beginning, the speed of the mind, of their minds, offensively at the most critical times, it's bang on. And that's the difference right now. We can talk about Bodrowski, but I think uh, just keep continuing. It's great to see things at this level. It's a little bit fast for me, but I don't mind. Thank you. Well, yeah, no, I'll I'll, uh, I'll try to I'll try to tailor it in a way that's like, okay, how can we coach it up, type of thing, instead of like I sometimes I get into that like where I'm talking to a player and need to learn to like slow it down and talk in a different context. Um, so the last one for the attacking off the turnover was the quick attacks. Now you have good <coughs> pressure. The opposing team is still able to defend, but now combining that, recognizing that someone is about to create a turnover, can we make a quick play to them? And here the first clip's going to be again with LA. So they're pressuring here. And off of, and again, there's talk, again what we were talking about before is once you force that turnover, how quick can you transition to your offensive spots? And this is more of like in that ozone look. Can we get into this pocket as quick as possible? He does a great job of it here. 
and like this is where like we can't it's very difficult to attack off the wall because the defending team's able to get into coverage so now really just trying to and again the mode is to try to simplify when when i'm trying to teach them i tell them like if you have space attack if you don't have space let's try to find an open man as quick as possible and again especially off that turnover you'll have those quick pockets like right here again he's not going to be able to attack off here but again going into that first point of okay let me recognize that turnover happens and the faster we can transition off of that it just it's just way too difficult to defend and here same thing defenders worked a lot with the d the more you're able to again force that turnover and now let's work to find those pockets here's the nice look i like this one because there's no busy feet very calm just working to find those nice little soft spots and boom and now again like detroit's all clustered even with five guys at the net very difficult we talked about uh, clearing the fifth was a concept we with our d we uh, with how aggressive everyone's up trying to get on offense always moving up the ice here and here offensively you can cheat that fifth guy because when you do that he's not going to really help you defensively on the back check and offensively any type of turnover you're able to make plays like this right away oh question that's what it was hell turs go ahead hell oh i think he left Okay. Sorry, Hal. And, uh, Mason, I'm going to make a point. I don't know whether it applies here. The, the moment, you know, the anticipation of the situation is what we're talking about here. Yes. It's not, oh, it turned over. Let's react. No, it's before it turns over, you can see and anticipate, predict what's going to happen. The players without the puck, and they can go to spots sooner than later. I think that's the, what I'm seeing is it's not once we get it, what do we do? It's are we aware of the potential consequences and possibilities of what we see? Uh, so when, when I'm watching the game at the NHL, it happens so fast, the teams that are succeeding get to the spots faster, the players without the puck, and the players with it, touch it, move yeah. it. Um, they use deception, but th there's just the time to me is the essence, and that's what I appreciate more watching your videos here is how quick the thinking of all the other players, like that fifth guy, yeah, hang back. Nobody's waiting for you. They're all in a defensive mode, up ice. So I just wanted to make that point is the thinking process is what it's all about. How do you coach That's my question. And, and I think the first phase of it is, I think you guys already have it, where Tom has these drills, these transition games, right? Um, and these things will allow you to process faster. They're going to allow you to okay, like I have to switch from offense to defense all the time. I'm constantly switching. From an individual standpoint where I found helps the most, a lot of the players that I had this year, we talked a lot about the eyes. And so the more we can, a lot of them really struggled with just like a basic drill of I'm here and I'm like stick handling and I'm looking this way, constantly looking to try and absorb new information. And so that allows you to multitask and that allows you to, and like I had this one player, he was as tunnel vision as they could get, probably one of the fastest guys in our league. And the second we started to, like at the beginning of practice, had him going up and down the wall. I had the wall on this side and now I was coming up this way. Anytime I put my stick down, he'd have to make a pass to me, but he'd be like stick handling and I'd make him use his peripheral vision and just scanning and then boom as soon as he sees it it's just working to get his eyes moving with me and then i'd get him to have his head here 
And now I'd be working in different spots on the ice for him to find me. And from an individual standpoint, I found that very helpful in just getting, slowing the game down, having one or two variables, but more so working his eyes as much as possible. It's one of those things that I feel like it's just not talked about, like it's mentioned, but it's never a focal point. So hopefully that the, the big long-winded answer, but to that's how I would train an individual to try and see these situations a little sooner, starting small and working your way up. Okay, um, Mason, I'm going to add something for you. I really like that idea. You've taken, you're coaching one kid, you're, 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 you're having him read the situation. You're creating scenarios differently that he has to make decisions off of. Um, and I've told this story too many times for everybody else, but it's uh, Johanny Walston 40 years ago did a drill on pass timing, which is basically transition because you're receiving a pass. Mm -hmm. and it was all about eye contact. The receiver is the timer. And that sequence to me, is the best teaching passing sequence at any age level, but particularly minor hockey. So they learn to make eye contact with the puck carrier, and the puck carrier has to make eye contact with the receiver. And the receiver is the timer, is the key phrase here. So that's what I'm saying. There's a transition. Now there's a play. And the timing of all those other four players is is what it's all about. But go ahead, Mason. I like that idea of your one-on-one, -on -one, what a coach can do with a player to get them look and deliberately learn that, but then apply it. And I think what Tom is doing with his kids by playing so many different scenario, uh, small area games, they develop that look around naturally because they're playing games. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. yeah. you're, not, you're not following a mindset of being told what to do and with tunnel vision, which the boy you're working with has been coached that way growing up. Yeah. Well, no, he's just, and again, and what I found this year too, and I'll, I'll get back into the video is it depends on the skill traits, right? A, we have a player that is a little bit slower and he's naturally very good at using his eyes because he can't navigate the game as well with his feet. So he's had to use his vision, his decision-making, his reading more often. Whereas this player and some of our other really, really fast, overly like, like these are just straight engines. They can go up and down like nobody's business. They've always had their feet as their guide or as their competitive advantage. And so they've never had to use their eyes enough. And so, and they're at our level for that reason. And once you try, and I found like with those types of players, specifically slowing it down and getting them to do that more was really helpful. So. Hey, Mason, before, uh, Tim Bothell, I don't know if he, two sessions ago, uh, Kachuk is one of the, poorest technical skaters in the league like he can't skate but he can think and i think your example here of how we evaluate players based on their flash and dash <laughs> how they catch your eye and i think this part of the hockey iq is what coaches are trying to develop more because we have so many skilled players, but not so many skilled, smart players. Yeah. So good point and keep up with the, the work. And, and uh, if you've got any more things to add on the video, go ahead. And if anybody else, Tim, I saw you uh, came on. We talked about Kachuk and the fact that you had mentioned he couldn't skate, but he can play. Well, yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, it might be a bit of an overstatement to say he can't skate. But he's, he's he's definitely, I, and you know what? I was thinking the exact same thing last night when I was watching the game, that he's just, by NHL standards, you know, he's not, you know, he'd be in the bottom, the bottom uh, half of, you know, sort of skating ability in the NHL. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't hamper him in any way, shape or form. Uh, like you say, because he's 
he's got such a high IQ and a high compete level and high skill level, all those things. So they just find new ways to compensate. And so it's, it's, it's very enjoyable to see when players are able to do that um, and still get it to the top level. So, um, but yeah, so yeah, here, I'll get back into this. So the last clip I had here was, this is my favorite player to watch. So I'm a little bit biased, but I do enjoy watching Kucherov. He is, he is a good skater at times. He does get a little lazy, but that's because I think like from a IQ standpoint, he sees the game so well. He's so sneaky, deceptive. He's an unbelievable playmaker. Like he gets into this pocket here, a little stick lift. And before you even know it, this puck's already going into this like pocket. And this is, this really goes into these three are so good together because they're able to read off each other. They know where pucks are going to go. They know what they're able to do. And it's just like so smooth. But being able to make that quick decision, find that guy before he even gets there, he knows that he's going to go there. And so that's the quickness of attacking off of a turnover. That was the first one I had. Here, I wanted to go into just the skill standpoint. And these drills were we used it was backhand, a forehand, or forehand, a backhand. And like the first touch when we show them this stuff, the first one is backhand, a forehand. And getting them comfortable, we worked a lot mostly with the D. I wish we did more with the forwards. The forwards were predominantly doing some other skill work before we started practice. But we started with a very bulky, mid-range skill level decor. And we had to be able to make plays. And when we implemented the ability of just backhand a forehand, forehand a backhand, creating a quality first touch, it, our breakouts by game 15, like we were just a mid-pack team, our D completely shifted, our forwards got pucks way more. And more importantly, in the Ozone, they were just way more confident. So that's just a side note to like working on that first touch. But here, the first one, it's going to come to Panarin right here, and he's going to use that. He's just so good. Like, again, touch it to space, in motion, off of here, backhand, forehand, and then Bohm makes a nice little play there. Good play to break it up. Here, especially under pressure, a lot of players, like, would just want to carry it. Whereas here, like, he uses that first touch and works himself into space. And by doing so, now he's able to, again, get a good body position, obviously a great stick lift, very high skilled, and then finds that pocket, great execution. And again, it's just that first touch backhand to forehand, backhand to backhand, and getting the space. Here, again, just being mobile, and you're going to see the next two clips is a lot of players get their top hand just like locked up on their hip or just super, super high. And here is just this like free flowing top hands like near the belly button. And you're able to just backhand, forehand transition into a shooting position all in one motion. And I know his head gets in the way, but you can see his top hand is just in front of his body. And it's just one smooth motion. And boom, I know that's the video is a little tough, but this one's a, a lot better. Right here, top hand in front of the bot, like right through the belly button. And it's touch. And now he's able to shoot. Same thing here. See the same thing right here. That top hand, super mobile. A very good quality first touch right across into that shooting position. One motion. And now that puck's off his stick. So Kim, that's the first Kim, one. Kim, one question? Yep. Uh, not, not, a, not a question, just a comment, which... Um, you know, we're we're all we've all talked about many many times before, but it'd be worth mentioning at this point. Like one of the best ways to teach these kind of skills would be, you know, Thomas Pacina, uh, the Czech Czech uh, cross ice game of two touch bochko, it's called. Um, and Mason, you may have heard of it before, but um, you know, basically you're playing a three on three game. And the players, uh, on their first touch of the puck, that counts one. And you only get one other touch of the puck, and that's it. 
you know, if you go forehand to backhand, you got to keep it on your backhand until you make a play. Um, and it, Boy. you know, it, once once teams understand the game and they understand if they touch it three times, there's, you know, you got to turn the puck over, you got to leave the puck. Um, it's one of the best games ever for improving both your power play, but all of your offensive skills. You know, we used to play it a lot at the Oval uh, with the girls at the Oval. Uh, when I was working with Danielle at University of Calgary, we would play 10 minutes of two-touch botch go twice a week, three times a week, uh, just to enhance the thinking process of the no dust, you know, not dusting the puck off, the under, under puck handling. But it's probably the best game, and it's great for the off puck people because if I see Mason pick up the puck in his forehand and then I see him put it on his backhand, as an off puck player, I know, ooh, I got to help Mason out by working to open space, by making myself more easily available to him because he's in trouble now. He's out of touches. He can't stick handle anymore. It's one of the best games uh, you could ever play um, to enhance that uh, underhandling of the puck. Tim, I, I want to bring up a question here, and I, you can help me on this. Uh, Thomas and I went to the Czech Republic after the 2002 Olympics and spent 10 days there. And uh, uh, we were familiar with this game. And I, I had a different uh, uh, appreciation of the, the, this game of botch, uh, uh, botchko, it was called. At any rate... The cross ice scrimmage uh, after a pro practice, players would stay out and, and play three on three cross ice. Goalies would stay in each net, and the rule was number one: you can only score off a pass. You can't carry it and shoot. So that's stage one. Now, when you play whole ice, it's the same rule: you can pass and head man it, but you can't score carrying it and shooting so that to me is the first phase when we went whole ice and tim when we went whole ice with two touch if they handled it three times they had to give give the puck to the other team now did you say tim they could put it on their back end but they had to pass it on their back end no i'm just trying to explain like if you if your first touch is on your forehand and then you put it on your back end. That, that's your two touches. And then you got to keep it on your back end. By you know, the, if you pick it up in your back end, then yeah. you put it on your forehand. That's your two touches. So now you got to keep it on your forehand. And so we we used to talk about you know three things really with the especially with the girls at UFC and and the Danish girls. So one of the key teaching points is when you touch the puck the first time move your feet and get your feet moving. And as you're doing that, the second point is that if you see a play, see a pass, make the pass and, and do it quickly. And then the third thing was, if you can't do, you know, you got your feet moving, you can't make a play, but now you got to think about protecting the puck mm -hmm. if uh, you're under checking pressure. But um, yeah, I mean, we played three quarter ice games and whether it's two touch or Tom's game of you have two seconds or three seconds with the puck, two seconds, 1,000, 2,000, that's it. You got to move the puck, you know, uh, three quarter ice games with passing outlets on either side. So it's effectively uh, uh, five on three or three on five. Anyway, uh, all kinds of games that really, really enhance that uh, thinking process of moving the puck quickly and the skill process as well of just moving it quickly. And I love the videos, uh, Mason, you know, you can show these to any level of player and just say, and just be repeatedly, hey, move it quickly. Instead of coasting, looking, thinking, get inside the dots, get to open space, move it quickly. Uh, all the clips are great for that.
Yeah, you you'll like the you like the next part where the you said about moving, and so all, like the punch phrase near the end of the year was accelerate off the touch, and it was yeah. just like man, like it was just crazy how we just get in this tripod mode, and it was once we got the message across especially like our more talented players. Like we had guys that shouldn't have been here. Like should have been in the AHL. Um, and they were just separating. It was crazy. The separation that they created. So yeah, you'll enjoy the next part is definitely a little bit more um, where you're the forehand uh, attacking and then accelerating off that touch where again, like you'll see here, this puck comes all the way down. And it's just that first touch into space, accelerate right into that pocket and like now he's in like that's a great a chance they basically should have scored on the goal here here is a defender activating off the rush like that first touch is i'm going to get to the middle of the ice away from pressure and then boom great under handle elite level shot and then this is the part again little bias really enjoy watching him but part of the reason is i think he's very very skilled but he does it in the most simple way in the most replicatable way like a drill like this we do after practice with players where lefties on this side righties on this side and i'd be over here they'd be coming up the wall i'd give it to them right back here and then it's boom accelerate into space so boom touch accelerates into the space forces everyone back into coverage and then just a beautiful play right to the top there. And again, I understand he's one of the best players in the NHL. Like I'm not delusional, um, but like right, right here off the corner, like it's a simple concept of, okay, I'm going to drive my feet into space. It's going to pull two people for that brief moment. And now it opens up the middle. And again, the extra passes just shows to how good those guys are. And the next two clips kind of play into the last part where this transition of let me touch it to space with a good quality first touch and then accelerate into that pocket. And Bunting does a great job here. And again, starting it back from this pocket. Boom, this puck's going to come here. Oh, no, it's short. It's kept my bad. And then boom, that nice first touch under handle right into space. And this clip goes up again but one of my favorite ones because it was off a little turnover in the D zone here. They transitioned into their breakout. Bertuzzi gets ahead of their de the opposing defenders, and it's that touch to space, and it's just an unbelievable goal. And I, like, and we started doing drills where with just, like, a couple D, couple forwards, D backs out into space here. The forward did, like, I'd be standing right here. Forwards would come across, quick touch to me, and then work up open up pivoting staying in motion kind of like Bertuzzi does and our deer opening opening up and then that cross ice quick touch to space and it's really replicatable and like right here it's just you see the quality of the touch like I love soccer and it's a very similar concept of okay how good is your first touch because it sets up like he's now in stride and can just take this thing right to the hole and it all comes off of that Again, just having a really good quality first touch and then accelerating off of the touches, again, like what you were just talking about, Tim. Yeah, Wally? Um, how do you teach that? So that, will like, going back, so that drill, like, talk about the first touch or the, um, the concept itself? Well, I'm talking about everything here. It's the thinking of touch passing. If you make... Like, I always criticize power plays at all levels because if they don't touch pass, yeah, if they don't deceptively quickly move the puck, they're not going to do anything. So um, I have a progression, and I've talked to Tom about it, and I'm curious about him doing it with his U13 girls that teaches the concept of what you're describing here. And I know Kachuk's line has scored goals off of the touch pass in the group of three in low zone play where the guy carrying past, the guy receiving knows he's going to touch it to the third guy who's going to score. Mm -hmm. So the passing drill I'm leading to is three-player passing with one puck in order, deliberate, small area. 
One carries, passes to two, who touches to three. Who carries, passes to one, who touches to two. That teaches awareness of, I'm, I'm receiving it, I have to touch it. I, the third player knows they've got to get open for it. And that, to me, the first time I've seen it happen in an NHL clip was one of the goals scored by uh, <clears throat> Florida. I think it was an OT goal, but that touch pass is something you can be taught. Mm -hmm. And it's teaching of the mind and the deliberate thinking like the Bochco drill did, whole ice with everybody. Progressively, you're teaching. You can carry it, but you can't shoot and score off the pass. You know, in the ozone, before you can score, the receivers have got to get open for you. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, that's the most important part here. Like what these guys are doing, I've it's taken every clip you've shown me when you've talked about first touch skill. That's to me the essence of the offensive advantage of space and time being taken. The question is when, when can you teach it? How can you teach it? And I believe that one, two, three passing drill, which my daughter gave to me playing with the national field hockey team is a no brainer to develop the mind and thinking ahead. It's a game of chess, not yeah. checkers. So no, absolutely. And so, so this concept's more for the individual and I'll, and I'll go through the, and I mentioned the one drill, this drill is the other one that I like to do to individually develop the first touch. And like what you're talking about, like I'll say like with a lot of the players in you, we keep them inside the one circle. I don't know why he keeps doing that. So I try to keep them inside the circle and we'll go with, just like you said, we'll have three players, but we'll keep them inside the circle. That's their constraint. And they're just touching back and forth, just working to find the space. And the way we'll develop like the group setting is add two pucks. So we'll have two pucks, three players, and then have players on the outside that they can pass to. So now you have these two pucks being touched around. These players don't have any pucks, but these, these pucks can go outside and now you're working to find space. So you have two pucks throughout the whole time. We'd have about three, four bodies on the outside and we'd have three bodies on the inside. So about seven, we have seven people working at a time in there. And it really gets like you start with the one puck and then when we progress to two pucks, and then we progress to having four people on the outside, even three, it doesn't matter. Whatever you kind of have is fine, but just adding that extra layer of finding someone else, that's that's how we did it this year. So we, and our, our coach, our head coach is actually really big on like those touch passes and getting players moving and thinking. And so that's where we really excelled in from like a smaller group standpoint. Um, but yeah, that's what we do with the team side. Off the individual side, this drill is no brainer again, and I mentioned it, but having the players, and you have like two or three players up here. I'd say up here because I like to get involved, get engaged here, but like they'd come up the wall just kind of in that tripod, very slow glide. And then I'd just, they'd be presenting their stick, lefties here, righties on the other side, and just really working this acceleration first to be into space to shoot because you got away from coverage. And then it'd be, we'd have a player right here and this acceleration, as soon as he accelerated off here, he'd pop to space and it's just a catch shooter one timer. And then this player would now filter back out. The player who passed would come into this spot and now they'd come in and do that same drill, touch, accelerate, he'd pop here and then one timer. That was, that would be essentially how we did it, which is from like more individual standpoint. Hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. So um, the last part here, um, I know we've been definitely been going for a little bit here. I'll, I'll make it short and sweet, the last part. And again, it's just accelerating off the touch, but where you see it all over the game. And I know it's McDavid, but again, you see this post up and just accelerating inside the dots. Um, we talked about with our players, whether your sticks to the middle 
and the next clip will be six to the outside, you have to be able to present an option and then get inside if you can. The faster you can do that or pull pressure to you, the better off you're going to be. Here, this pass was a little bit fumbly, but again, sticks now in a protective position. We talked about protecting your stick. And now you can't get to the inside. Let's pull coverage to you. And he does a great job of accelerating into the body. And now you have one of the best players in the world on the back post. Same thing here. Again, a little more. This transitions happen. Let me try to find someone here. And again, it's protecting the stick, accelerating. And again, you'll see this in the neutral zone regroup. You see this in the control four check. I mean, control breakout. And it's really effective. And, and again, same thing here. Off these breakouts. And you see that first touch. The, the more, the higher quality that first touch is, the more effective this way of playing. And we've already saw this clip already. It's already inside the same package. It just sets up your ability to get on that offensive side so much quicker. And here, there's going to have like two more, three more clips here. Sorry, Wally, you have a question. And I'll stop right there. Oh, Tim just left. Sorry. But yeah, sorry. I thought there was a question there. And then catching that pass in motion where I saw, again, off the control breakout, staying in motion, and it just pulls people to you when you're able to just catch that puck in motion. I love, again, talking about presenting the stick here. He does a great job of doing that, opening up, doesn't lose speed, stays in the motion, and now they're able to keep their attack going. Here, same thing, in motion, foam, able to attack off the rush really well. And then the lat, again, going through this again, Great quality first touch, staying in motion. Last one here off the control breakout. Tarasenko sneaking right behind them. And you'll see here off the play, he's reading, recognizing, presenting that stick, and now able to make that play, touch it into space, and finish with that execution. And so really the application in the neutral zone is in those control breakouts in those quick up breakouts, in the neutral zone regroup. And that's where you see this quality first touch applied in a very easy, I think it's a very easy way to describe it to players and teach it. And it's, you're going to see the quickest bang for your buck once players get a good first touch, get a good feel, get a good understanding. And now you're able to really set up your team play by developing an individual skill. So that's, yeah, that, those were the three videos I wanted to show and share and really talking about that transition game. Um, again, all the other stuff we talked about, uh, whether it's Tom's transition games, uh, Wally, some of the concept, the, the games that you were mentioning, I think those are, um, even Tim as well, those are very applicable games that are going to pull these skills together and then force the individual to find a way to navigate it and apply what we're talking about to create some more offense because really at the end of the day, that's what we want to be able to do. Mason, my big question, I, I, uh, Sammy Joe and, and Rick in particular, I, I was, I'm thinking myself in 2002, we were still learning to pass and shoot and score like deliberately shoot with power and accuracy. Mm -hmm. But by 2010, the female game had evolved and it hasn't evolved to this level yet, Sammy. How far away are we from, you know, and you're working in the professional league with the best women in the professional league in Toronto. How, uh, how far away are they from appreciating and applying and absorbing and taking the game to this level? Well, Wally, I think you're right. It certainly has um, transformed a lot in the last little bit. But I do think some of the players, this is how they think, for sure. I mean, I think that that's what separates them from being, you know, and I look at somebody like Maddie Philippe Poulain, like how is she so good compared to the the best, right? And I think this is what she does so well, is she's thinking about that first touch. I loved Mason when you... Um, 
regarded it like soccer as to setting yourself up for the next step and thinking of it more like chess a couple moves in advance. Um, you know, I would say that women uh, hockey players, for the most part, at a younger age, have a better thought process when it comes to the game and don't necessarily have the skill to go along with it. And so I think this is something very teachable at those early, say at Tom's uh, group's age, um, because I think they're more willing to absorb things. And so I think it is something that will come very quickly to all players in, in the women's game. I think what what I see a big difference at our level is that first step after the first touch mm -hmm. that, you know, I think players are thinking about that first touch, but not necessarily have the ability to back it up with that skill to then explode off that. Um, but it's funny when you're doing all the clips, Mason, I, I was watching the goalie most of the time. I had to really <laughs> focus on like not watching the goalie. And so many of the transition clips, the goalie is simply not scanning. So the goalies, we have also that same uh, concept within the game of you should always be checking to see where everyone is. And a lot of them, especially in ozone turnovers, had um, stopped thinking that their D or their forwards are carrying the puck out and had sort of relaxed a little. And that, it, to me, is what caused the goal, not necessarily the great play but that the goalie um, didn't track the puck all the way out of the zone. So uh, that's what I saw, that the goalie was simply on wrong angles, consistently very deep, um, and had sort of put their hands down to take a breather, is what it looked like. Yeah. And then was all off angle and was trying to uh, catch up the whole play. So anyways, I, that, it was hard for me not to look at the goalies all the time. <laughs> It's hard for the goalie mind to stop looking at goalies and look at players. I know, because they're doing so much wrong in yeah. those early clips that you were showing. But I digress. Well, no, it, but it's a great awareness, too. Like, even with the players, I try to tell them, especially, so we'll, we'll use the hash marks as a marker when we're, like, attacking or any type of turnover in the O zone. Hash marks to the goal line, it's a weird gray area for goalies we finally like, okay, like, are they transitioning into the post? Are they going to do the overlap? Like, what is, what is their game plan? And so try to tell them, like, if you got nothing and you're attacking, just tossing something that's a little bit taking 20, 30% off your shot, it's going to catch them by surprise. They don't really, it's a weird position for them. So they're for playing sure. percentages. Even that one where, I'm not sure if it was the Jets where it was Shifley was in front of the net or who that was that was down low in front of the net. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, coming out as the, the fifth one out of the zone. Um, I mean, that that should be a very simple play for a goalie in front. He doesn't make a great move or anything. It's just simply dumping the puck in, and the goalie just doesn't seem ready. But you have a man standing right in front of you. Like, you you got to be ready until they leave the zone, you know? Yeah, anyway. and that's a good rule of thumb for, like, again, for a goalie. Like, it actually like recruiting goalies is probably one of the hardest things to do at our level. Cause we just don't have a goalie guy. We have like a part, like a, the NHL gives us a guy that comes down. He's awesome, but he's only down for four times a year. So right. like we only know so much and it's interesting. Cause like when you're recruiting a goalie is the goalie engaged until the pucks out of the zone or are they just like, Oh, we got the puck. We're all good. And then turnover happens. It's like, oh boy, this is going to be, and it goes into the theme of today, which is transition. They can't transition back fast enough. Right. And the panic mode that, that ensues. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and that happens. Yeah, it was uh, interesting watching that. So, Sammy, how would you use what you've seen looking at as a goalie? It's like, we're watching it like offensive players. I watch it like defensive players. Like, I was watching the players uh, playing defensively more than I was after the transition. And that's sort of how we're conditioned by the positions we played or coached at. But how would you, if you coached his goalies and you had those clips, how would you use those clips with his goalies? Well, I think there's kind of a rule of thumb uh, in goaltending, obviously the games are long, the two and a half hour, three hour games where you're mentally on. You can't be mentally on the whole time or you're you would go bananas. I mean, you'd be so exhausted. 
So you have to take a breather. But the rule of thumb is on the way in as they're transitioning into your zone from the red line, you should you should be ready. I mean, the, the game is so fast. You should be ready at that point. And then on the way out to the blue line, because once they've passed the blue line, you can take a breather and you can start to be a fan. You have to be able to transition your brain into um, going 90 miles an hour to simply being a fan and watching the game. Um, and then, you know, anticipating that when it comes back over the red line, you can then get back into mode. But you do have to take some breathers or you're going to be mentally exhausted. To me, these were all mistakes that these goalies all know that. I mean, it's, that's not something that they don't know. But often these will happen um, late in a, a shift that they've been hemmed in or um, late in a period and the goalie is maybe not as mentally aware. So I think with the advent of goalies standing higher now and having sort of more of an upright stance, it's hard to decipher if the goalie is actually ready a lot of the times. Yeah. Um, and so it becomes really up to the goalie to ensure that they are there because these clips are tough because the goalie is kind of in a high stance, which now nowadays that's the expectation. Um, and because of that a high stance, that's why a lot of them were just like low redirects in in tight, in tight, because the goalie was up so high with the, these new little like mini sticks that they play with. So that's for a whole nother discussion. But if I was the the coach coaching the goalies in these situations, it would just be a reminder to track those pucks, follow those pucks and keep scanning until that last player has crossed the blue line on the way out and then take your breather. I I want to do, uh, we have some minor hockey coaches that watch this. In fact, we've got an awful lot of minor hockey coaches who respond in appreciation. And sometimes when we do a session like this at that level of play, minor hockey coaches are tend to have higher expectations of what their players should do. So I get concerned about showing advanced tactics. And Tom's coaching U13, coaching U15 girls next year, and he's coach pro in Europe. Uh, Rick coached AAA in Canada years ago. And I'm worried about minor hockey coaches and what are they taking out of this or are they going to be expecting too much or say it's impossible and get more frustrated when the kids can't do something because they've it's too advanced? Well, Wally, I can tell you that simply with my seven-year-old Squishmallows, um, what I think this whole, like the whole video sequence I think is great and just simply that first touch thinking about it I think is really key and being prepared. That's what I take out of this whole thing is be prepared with the scans of what is, I mean, the majority of my coaching, obviously at the Toronto six level, I am the president. So I'm not coaching. I mean, I'm watching like a fan. And so I'm not doing that, but I either coach uh, U seven or adult women rec. And so this is very basic, but simply the idea of going into a play and looking to see who's around me. Just that I think is just just such an amazing concept that most players don't do. You'll, you'll separate yourself from 90% of the players at those entry levels if you simply do that. And I think that that's what makes this this really shows if you can connect the dots between what is happening there and there. That's huge. That's yeah. oh, awesome. I, that, that was the goal. So hopefully I'm glad it translated. Rick, any comments? Uh, you're mentoring now, and this is a fairly, you know, it's an important concept, but it's, it's a fundamental one that there's a starting point on. Scanning, thinking, awareness, processing what your vision is. So what do you think, Rick, relative to if you're going to coach today and suddenly turn into a 30-year-old? What would you take away to apply at the level you coached at from this? What are they ready for when you're working with them? Well, um, just just listening earlier on, Wally, I was I was happy to see uh, the idea and the concept that we teach the kids how to how to think, how to go about the game 
from the neck up. Um, you know, just touching on on evaluating players. The first thing I look when I'm evaluating players is what is their head doing? We can all see who can skate fast and shoot hard. But what are they doing with their head? Are they, is it fixed or is it scanning? It's one of the first things that I pick out, especially the higher level players that I'm working with. My second thought is that, you know, you asked a question about minor hockey coaches. If they get this and they start trying to do some of this and the kids aren't ready and they get frustrated because they can't. We do need to be teaching more of this. In my mentoring, I don't see very much uh, teaching the concepts of the game, uh, teaching them how to read and how to react, what to look for, what to do uh, when they when they see a result, a reaction on the other side. What do they do? And so if this fosters uh, more thinking in that area and more direction in that area, and then teaching them the skills that go along with, uh, you know, do, doing the things they do to react to, to space and to what they see um, in the terms of pressure or open ice or support, it's all good. But again, it's got to be addressed as a package. It can't be isolated. I know you've got to run, Mason, but I, I wanted to make a point here. I'm I'm working with a an ex NHL European pro player coaching his daughters at U11 and U13 spring hockey, and he did a a two a two pressure the puck four check third player high. There's no reading and reacting. And it's effective because at that age level, it's just pressure, pressure, pressure. But they played a team from Saskatchewan on the weekend who was at a higher skill level, better team play. They moved the puck. And that forecheck, they never even had an opportunity to take advantage of a one, two, two, or backing off and steering and trying to create where you could pressure after the breakouts. So, I, I'm worried about coaches who have, this is the way we're going to play. This is what we're going to do. The kids aren't going to ever learn to think and figure things out. So FIO is sort of a, an acronym. Figure it out. Every situation you're talking about, allow them to figure it out. Don't tell them what to do and demand what they do because pretty soon they're robots. And you develop players that have never scanned before at your level. Yeah. And once you show them at your level that they can, they will improve. But if you start young enough, and I we used to say, well, when can you teach hockey sense? Oh, they said 13, 14. I say bullshit. You can teach it at any age if you let them think. You can teach thinking at any age. So I'm really glad those points came up. And Tom, go ahead. And Mason, if you have to leave, we understand. Uh, we usually go for a couple hours, you know, and we might hang in here and talk about it. But uh, where are you at, Mason? What town? So I'm I'm in Greenville, uh, Greenville, uh, South Carolina. But I'll be back. I'll be in Green Bay uh, starting next week. That's where I stay in the summers. And yeah, like I'll. Again, I, I didn't know how long it was going to be, so that's why like the timing was uh, uh, no problem, no problem. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll be on weekly, and yeah, again, love to connect and talk and hear more of everyone else's thoughts. Um, anything else that comes up, obviously, will be recorded. And yeah, no, I'm very excited. Uh, and anything you guys, any questions you have, feel free to reach out. And um, okay, well, Tom, Tom's got a point here, and I'd like you to hear it in case you can respond. Go ahead, Tom. Well, Mason, you mentioned uh, you want to know the, the name of my hockey site. Yes, the website. It's, it's hockeycoachingabcs.com, all one word. You can send them a link uh, through the chat, Tom. ABC, <laughs> hockeycoachingabcs.com. Yeah, that's one way. I got it down. Yeah. Just yeah. ABC. Pen and it's paper. Mason. That's how we do things. Mason, what's Brian up to? Uh, I'm actually going to go help him with his camp in, uh, uh, end of July. He's, uh, with St. Cloud. He actually was oh, coached here. Yeah. yeah. I knew that. 
I knew that. I think of the conference. I don't know if he was coach. Was he coach here? I feel like he was. He had yeah. an unbelievable year, though. It was the group, yeah. the way they started. So we had a couple of their girls down in Green Bay for um, – there was a central district camp there. And they are they're pretty decent, but, like, where he got them to and how that team to play – against like the best teams in the country was unbelievable. But yeah, he's, he's loving it. He's saying it's, especially now with the portal, it was much easier to turn the team around because you have access to more players now. It just, he said it took him 10 years to do that with old, it was old program. Whereas like this year you could, you could switch it all around. Like you're getting grade A players right away. Yeah, so. that's right. I, Peter told me he was there. Uh, I, I did know that. So uh, say hello for me when you, no, for sure. Yeah, I'm going to, yeah, like I said, I'll go down for two weeks, work with their girls for uh, about two, yeah, approximately two weeks or so. They have, they're going camps until the uh, beginning of August. So, but yeah, I'll tell them you said hi. Yeah, yeah, good man. Okay. Mason, I just want to share with you before you head out, <clears throat> I ran into a gentleman that was scouting uh, at a national team camp and he got to talking about coaching and he was, coaching soccer and then he was coaching hockey and one of the soccer coaches was counting passes oh boy and he says the ability of their team to complete passes and his tracking of it and letting it be known that we make completed more passes he did it with his hockey team yeah. and he ended up getting an umpire's counter and oh that's a good that's a good idea and halfway through the season, other coaches were approaching him and saying, you guys look like the Russians. <laughs> so we can talk about, like, you've got that. I love that circle drill with three inside, four inside, two on the outside. Mm -hmm. But, you know, average coaches, and I know parents would say, what the hell is this for? <laughs> but just counting passes, they can know. We pass, we got the puck, we possess it, we own it. So Tom Malloy last year, he kept track of passes. One of his parents tracked the passes. And Tom won game, I think they outpassed the team 50 to four. Oh boy. And the, what they were doing with the puck offensively was the closest thing I've seen to what these videos show me relative to that age level. Mm -hmm. They weren't afraid to pass. They overpassed, but it was because if if you're passing and using each other, you're you're changing mathematics. One and one is going to add come to three. No, you, you it sounds like the triangle offense right there. Yeah, oh. yeah, and he did it very well. And um, I don't know, uh, Tom, if you want to talk about like he said that triangle offense, and when you went. To, offensively with that triangle with the two forwards going oof, uh, winger to winger behind the net to the slot player sliding into the hole. That was like an NHL clip. And he did it with U13 girls. Now it's all relative to the speed, but those kids were thinking and moving and making their own decision, which coaches tend to stifle. Oh, for sure. Well, hey, yeah, I do have to head out. I appreciate you guys having me on here. And, yeah, let's keep her going. Some good. I definitely want to get in the triangle. We could probably stay on here for hours talking about it. Ooh. But we could, talk, <laughs> we could talk about all this stuff. So, yeah, like next week I look forward to it. And uh, let's keep getting after it. Okay. Thanks, Mason. You guys have a good one. We'll see ya. Okay. I was going to, I was going to mention too, Wally, that, you know, it's just, it's kind of, it's funny, um, like when you talk about counting the passes, it's a great idea, and the umpire counter is a great idea to plant the seed about puck movement, but it's also a balancing act, because, especially with the girls, because if, if their mindset becomes puck movement, they can stop thinking about they can tend to stop thinking about, oh, you know what? The objective is actually to score a goal. And and the, the best example for that is, you know, the add-on game where you play two-on-two cross ice 
And, you know, if you make a pass out to an outlet and then back into somebody and they're both tape to tape passes, you get to add a player to make it three on two. And then you could add another player to make it four on two. They, they start thinking that the objective of the game is to get another player instead of scoring. And a player can like have a, an opportunity for a breakaway to score, but instead they, they turn away and they pass so they can get another player on us. Like, Hey, ladies, ladies, let's remember the game is about scoring first. So you need to have those two thoughts in your head, not, not just, not just passing or not just adding a player, but scoring is the main thing. It's kind of well, funny. I've never seen a team overpass. I would have said Tom's team might have because, but they passed for possession to advance the puck and to score. It was quite amazing. So, um, uh, Jordan, I don't know if you're, are you available? Hey, Wally. Yeah, I'm just on the bus uh, heading over to the rink with my grade five, six, uh, uh, hockey program, so we're just making our way that direction. Okay. Well, I guess the something that I, you know, it's just it's the the weakest skill in North America, and it isn't passing that's the weak skill; it's receiving. So when we talked about Johanny Walston's progression, eye contact, one, two, three, three pucks and a circle with six players on the outside passing to each other. And get three pucks, the two pucks go to one player. They have to learn to look, see there's a player available and make that pass. The next two drills build on that progression. This can be taught. So I think at the minor hockey level, there's some cardinal fundamental teaching drills and skill progressions that sort of are not, well, they're, they're not ignored. They're, they're sort of unknown and left up to skill experts to work on those fundamental skills. And many of them work on more advanced skills than they do fundamental skills. So... With minor hockey coaches, I'm saying teach those skills, let them play, count passes. You might have a chance for success versus trying to really get good at teaching every aspect. You might be a better coach because of it. So, on that theme, Wally, it's not only teaching; it's it's got to be uh, stressed consistently, persistently throughout the whole course of the season and and reinforced you can't teach it and say that's accomplished and move on and never refer back to it again and that's a mistake that i see made far too often the coaches you're watching out in your community just generalize as a group all of them how would you rank their teaching ability from one to ten Well, like any group, you've got a, you've got uh, some that are better and some that are are not quite as good, largely based on experience as, as much as anything, in my opinion. Um, but overall, yeah, if you're averaging it out in a four or five category, and it's not so much that they're not teaching, it's that they're teaching in very narrow areas. They're not teaching the broad part of the game, and as I said briefly earlier, they teach it and move on to something else as if it's ingrained now and, and never to be referred to again, when in reality, it, there's a constant reminder and a reinforcement that needs to go on again, in my opinion. That's where I've had my most success. Tom, have you got anything to add uh, given the entire session and your wisdom? Well, I think, like Rick says, you have to always return to things. You know, Terry Johnson always, he would always say you need at least three times before they'll catch on to the concept. You know, if you're introducing something new. So that, that was one of his things. I, I just think, you know, like 
you're doing all those passing games like I do, but you know you can also have passing games that only one pass is allowed in the offensive zone, and that player has to score. You know, or you know, or goals are only allowed on given goals and things like that. So you just, you know you've got to vary what you're doing to get all the con- you know get the whole complete game you're trying to teach. So it's uh, we all know it's. They all learn at different speeds, and they come from different, uh, you know, backgrounds, and you know. And then if they're getting ten bucks a goal, they might not want to pass. <laughs> That's something that happens too. Yeah. So, it's the art. It's the art. Uh, part of the art of coaching is the balance between, because repetition is, for sure, a big part of. Like learning a new skill, learning a new way to think. Like you, you got to be in, put in the situations a number of times. So repetition is really important, but keeping things fresh and doing things different is also important. Well, teaching it, teaching the same thing from different angles. Yeah, different using ways. a different a different drill or a different exercise. Yeah. Tom, you mentioned the uh, parents that pay their kids to score, and I think. You can add grandparents to that list. <laughs> um, guilty? Sounds like someone speaking from experience. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I haven't fallen into that trap. My mm. daughter has. <laughs> mm. Paying her daughter, uh, my granddaughter. But uh, I have to comment on Cassie Campbell's mother. When I did that mission statement exercise, she spoke to that. We had done the mission statement exercise, and she got up and said, when Cassie played minor hockey, people were paying kids to score goals. And she spoke up and paid them for every assist. And that sort of changed the mindset. It's keep track of that, because what we're talking about here is that Yes, we have to score. That is the most important outcome, but it's not going to happen without the other. So we're trying to take hockey from one-on-five hockey to being drafted and being caught to really learning how to play the game. And we're long for ways from it because, you know, as parents, we're human. We want our kids to grow and develop, and um, we don't realize that Hockey is a a very unselfish, selfish game where you own the puck and protect it. Well, Wally, we just you know we're talking about that tack attack that uh, Spain used, right? It's all one touch, yeah. And always being in triangles, the, the games are so similar. And to get a lot of good ideas, because there's so you know hundreds of millions of people playing soccer. That's a real resource of kind of things they do. Yeah. Because again, you know, the games are really, really similar. I I have to mention uh, John Casaloni. He's a soccer coach. I've <laughs> seen more national team practices and pro practices taking notes. And he has presented at Hockey Alberta. He's run ice times and off ice times at Hockey Alberta. This past week, uh, my daughter was in Manitoba for the U of M camp. He was running it. Somehow he crossed paths with the high performance coach of the team, a girl from Mexico who had played pro in Spain, and he ran the um, ice time. So my son in law sent me a picture of him with a granddaughter, and he talked about what he did all games. All small area competitive varieties of games with one rule, no walking. If you walked, you did push-ups. You had to keep moving, keep jogging and running. But when you walked, he says he wanted that mentality of staying alert and being aware and physically demanded a lot more of all of them. The game's taught. I think that's the bottom line here. Is Dean's good friend. Yeah. 
So uh, I'm looking forward to getting a hold of John again, and I may bring him on as a guest to talk about what he does and the game of hockey and the game of soccer and comparison. And and uh, he'd be a great speaker because he can talk hockey as much as he can talk soccer, but he can overlap and bridge the gap and bring that connection between. I mean, he was on to small area games before anybody else was. And this University of Manitoba team, they ran some pretty good practices, but nothing like this camp has just opened the eyes of of uh, the coaching staff and myself and the parents who were there. So really good to have you guys on today. It's uh, I just want to give you a heads up. I, on top of things medically, I'm wearing an arm sleeve. It's a compression sleeve, 100 bucks, and the swelling's going down, and the range of movement is improving, and I'm back on my blood thinners. I've cut it in half to what it was, and I'm hoping to re be back at normal, going to uh, Kyle's ice time tonight uh, with his U, uh, U11 team, so still in the game. Jordan, are you there at the rink yet, or? Okay, he's uh, got his uh, elementary school minor hockey class going. Yep, there he is. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're here, Wally. We're okay. Just, just offloaded off the bus, and uh, I was going to mention to you that I uh, had a quick conversation with Al Andrews this morning. Um, he is heading towards uh, Quebec City for a, a showcase there with a team. And uh, they're excited about what's going on this spring with them. And, and one of the conversations we had ties into the passing piece with uh, what uh, I call one versus five hockey instead of one-on-one -on -one hockey where it goes to the awareness piece um, and that players aren't aware. They're aware that there are five players on the other team but they're not necessarily aware that they have four others on their own that they can uh, take advantage of. It just looks like they're trying to beat the other team by themselves. And uh, that's kind of what you and I saw the other day in that spring hockey. So it's uh, well, something we've got to com combat, uh, combat against. Mason's uh, very early uh, video showed that. It showed the people away from the puck and what they were doing just before they got possession. So they were moving <clears throat> to support positions, anticipating transition and participating a turnover. And uh, that's the one thing I got out of this is the awareness level of that level of play, it, it was uh, beyond my expectations. Yeah, that sounds good, Wally. Well, I'll look forward to looking at it. You guys okay. have a good day. I'm going to head into the rink. Okay, take care. Have a good one, Jordan. Yeah, bye. Jordan, gotta gotta run. Gotta run as well, guys. So we'll okay. see you next week. Um, pretty cool about Florida being in the final. Like they they really deserve. I'm so happy for Paul Maurice. He's such a a good person, a good coach. Um, but who'd have thunk? It's too bad that Carolina. I mean, you know, you imagine if you take Barkoff and and Kachuk off of the Florida lineup what they might be able to accomplish. And Carolina has been missing their two of their top forwards, really the whole playoffs almost. So too bad for them, but that's hockey, as they say. Yeah. Did you see afterwards they're talking about it and that if uh, the last game of the season, Chicago had to beat uh, Pittsburgh for Florida to even be in the playoffs. Yeah. And, and they did that. Yeah. It's a, it's a freaking. uh, it's a great story. I don't know if you guys saw the stat too on Barkoff. It was, I think, might have been in game two, or maybe in game early game three, that they put it up briefly. They didn't get all of it, but he is first in the playoffs in defensive zone takeaways, defensive zone uh, passes deflected. I forget how they worded all that stuff. In five different defensive categories, he was number one in the playoffs basically defending with his stick and takeaways and that sort of thing. Pretty impressive for an, a really 
terrific offensive guy, obviously. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Oh, you're muted, Wally. I just read this morning that Bob Rob, uh, Bobrovsky set a record for most saves in the first three games of a, a semifinal game. He huh. broke jo Johnny Bauer's record from like 1965, I think, or something like that. Well, he got Carolina out chanced him every game. Oh. They just, they probably outplayed them. He, Bobrovsky was unbelievable. Yeah, and to think that he didn't even he didn't even play the first four games of the playoffs or whatever it was, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Tim, one of the th things that I'm, you know, watching everybody, but the uh, Toronto situation and what's happened to Dubas, and some follow-up interviews, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm just going from what I heard in the press and what I heard on the news and sports. Uh, apparently, Dubas said uh, he. There were things that could have been done that needed to be done, but there's sort of a difficulty in decision making. They couldn't make decisions that might have made a bigger difference. And that's one of the reasons that I'm reading between the lines that he was, he didn't get to keep his job. He wasn't in charge of, uh, you know, sort of streamlining the process of decision making relative to the group, what needed to be done. So that's one of the reasons he left. And um, I have always worried about that. And I'm looking at the flames and Craig Conroy coming on and his philosophy. And uh, he mentioned one key word and, and I, I, I believe him. And that word is collaborative. And he talked about first thing you're going to do is have a captain, somebody who can speak to the coach. And uh, when they talked about this, Con Conroy mentioned nobody felt comfortable talking to the coach. So they never had that conduit of trust and respect, which I think any successful organization uh, has to have. And how you achieve it? In the NHL, from the managerial down to the you name it level, uh, that's sort of a, the art of leadership that goes along with the art of coaching. So, it's, I think I think part of the like you're saying, Wally. I think part of the problem in the Toronto situation. I have a a friend who is you know has some knowledge of the, all the people involved in the situation, but. You know, the guy at the very top, Larry Tannenbaum, who runs Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, he's probably the biggest problem. Like he, you know, sticks his fingers in where he shouldn't stick them in. And that might be what Dubas is alluding to, that maybe even he and Shanahan wanted to do some things and Tannenbaum wanted to do something differently or whatever. Yeah. Who, knows what the, who knows what the truth is, but, um, you know, I don't know. It was a self-inflicted wound by Dubas. It sounded, by by all accounts, and and according to Elliot Friedman too, by all accounts, they were pointed directly in rehiring him, and then his, he he. It seems like he wanted out, um, and he may have crafted his exit in a. Anyway, I I, I don't really, yeah. I I think a lot less of him, Dubas, now than I. Than I did before. It'd be interesting to hear. We'll never know. Probably Haley and uh, and uh, Danielle and and Daryl what their take on the whole situation would be. But um, you know, when you have when you have one of your key people saying, "Well, you know, I got to figure out if I really want to be here." Why would you? Why would you want to rehire that person? Yeah. Um, so anyway, when I watched. Um, the playoffs and the camera would go up to Dubas and Shanahan sitting together and Haley's been sitting beside them at times but when the heat was on uh, this is one thing uh, I would ask Haley about he you could see he was emotionally affected 
by the ups and downs of the game. And I believe that if a coach is reacting emotionally to the situation, he's not really in the future. And I think as a GM, my evaluation of a GM would be if you're overreacting, you're not really ready to GM because the coach has to have composure have the behavior in line because any kind of overreaction that visibly will be seen by anybody watching television and watching replays and somehow that reaction to your feelings is coaches have to be in control of expressing those emotions to to stay ahead of the behaviors but we contrast Dubas with you know the shots of Jim Neal during their series, you know, completely sort of stone-faced and just taking it all in and, like you say, staying in the moment and being thoughtful. And yeah, uh, it didn't work out for them either. <laughs> but uh, it was quite a contrast, the, the shots of Jim Nill versus Dubas in, in the press box. No, but it's all about leadership and uh, just trying to make everybody better. And um, thanks for coming on. Guys, I got to head out to uh, the doctor's checkup just to see how things are going. And uh, Tom might hang around and chat a bit more, but I, I've got to head out now. So I'm stopping the My recording. Dog a major accident, so I got to clean that up. Yeah, I got to head out too. Yeah. Okay, guys, thanks very much week. for your time. Take care.